Tim Wilson is a former Human Rights Commissioner and was one of the Liberal MPs in that video debate you saw that got scrapped after activists complained that the other MP, Andrew Hasty, was against same-sex marriage. Now, Tim Wilson is for same-sex marriage and he joins me now. Tim, great to see you again, mate. Hey, listen, uh, Good to see as you, I said at the top, I, I, you know, as you know, I can be talked into same-sex marriage. Uh, I've seen happy marriages of that kind, uh, relatives and, and friends, and I'm not Christian. And uh, as you know, my only concern really all along has been that any such change does not weaken what I think is a very important tradition that keeps parents of children together. But, Tim, this bullying by same-sex marriage activists, I, it seems to me now immoral that I would give in to this. Well, I think we need to be clear that this uh, isn't just something that's around marriage for same-sex couples. It's an issue of the modern left progressive worldview where they can't debate issues, they actually don't have the skills or the capacity to do so or the reason to do so. So what they seek to do is silence uh, anybody and censor anybody that they disagree with. It just happens to be this issue that they're using as a vehicle. They do it in lots of other debates as well because there are plenty of people who argue for a change in law around marriage who don't subscribe to this worldview at all. So I, I think it's unfair to tarnish everybody who advocates for a change in law in that camp, but certainly as part of the modern left progressive playbook, it is something that is regularly used. But, look, when you were at the Human Rights Commission, you were particularly, well, your focus was advancing free speech, and this has been a cause yes. very uh, dear to you for many, many years. Where does this anti-free speech push, this, this call for safe spaces and trigger warnings and bans and all, where's it coming from? Well, well, I care about freedom, and I care about freedom in all of its forms. And uh, it comes back from debates that were had in the 60s about uh, social pressure and institutions and whether they created patriarchies and heteronormative behaviour and all of those things. And what the left has done over a very long period of time is gone through institutions, stacked them out with their people, so they've now become the dominant authority within society. And their objective has always been to use sociological theory to rebalance society and to silence and censor people they disagree with for raising difficult or unpopular views. So this is just a fulfilment of a march through the institutions that you're very well aware of dating back to the 60s. And now they're in position of authority, they don't like to be challenged. Yeah, but it just seems to me a, a totalitarian instinct, which is a worry. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm generalising broadly, I know that, Tim, and, you know, because there are people yeah. on both sides that would... But basically, it seems to me that conservatives and rationalists tend to think if the other side's wrong, it, we can talk it over, we can argue it, they're just wrong. But with too many on the collectivist left, this activist left, it's, you're not wrong, you're actually evil. And so we shouldn't even let you speak yes. because you are actually evil. Am I onto something there? And, and that's fundamentally right, because what we're seeing now is a dehumanising of people if you disagree with them. You can't say this because of your race, because of your gender, because of your sexual orientation, or whatever it is. It isn't just about censoring and silencing. It's actually about questioning the legitimacy of your place in society to have discussion and to have debate in the hope that they won't have to then go on and engage with you. Because at the heart of their arguments is theory that most people, it doesn't reflect people's real world, which is most people are good natured, they want to go on and contribute good things to society. They want to take care of themselves, their family and their community. And as a consequence, um, uh, that can sometimes be intolerable because it doesn't fit within the perfect worldview of the modern left. And you've given plenty of examples on your program already. We had another one earlier this year with Ayan Hirsi Ali, where as a critic of Islam, she wasn't able to come out, uh, or she was able to come out, but was with the threat of massive protests to the point that she withdrew. And it's not just the laws like Section 18 see the Racial Discrimination Act. It's also a culture of intimidation and that's why you always have to stand up for free speech from principle and we always have to be prepared to stand up for people who we disagree with and I've done that uh, with Margaret Court. I disagree with her on the issue but at the same time we have to be honest when she gets a response and people counter argue with her they're not just they're not bullying her they're just having a difference of opinion. If they try and silence or censor her or erase her history like they are with uh, Margaret Quarterina, then I think there's something very serious going on. Um, going to this particular issue though, uh, same-sex marriage, um, you're passionately for it obviously and uh, I can under I certainly understand why and you know um, we're friends so I, I understand all that history but how damaging is it 
to the cause when you see the most vocal kind of activists uh, uh, acting like this. I mean, it's just, it's terrible. Well, I'm for um, marriage for same-sex couples because it's a freedom issue just like freedom of speech. People's freedom to live their lives as they see fit and for the government not to come along and tell them what they can and can't do. That principle applies to both of those debates. But when people discard other people's freedoms or disagree uh, with their objective to the point they want to silence and censor people, it delegitimizes having a discussion about freedom at all. So how bad is it? It's disastrous um, because uh, average citizens, average Australians look at the issue and go, oh, well, they want to achieve some sort of or replace some form of oppression with a new type of oppression that might be used against me. Uh, and that's why I think uh, people are very nervous when they see these things, and they should be. That's why you can never let the, the, the progressive left win, uh, uh, Andrew. You've got to always stand up against them. As you do. But this, but this, but this uh, uh, raises the, the point, like, what comes next, Tim? Because um, if we do legalise same-sex marriage, and we're already getting this bullying now with people having their jobs threatened, their businesses threatened, uh, their physical safety threatened, um, if it becomes law, you could, risk, you could lose your job by expressing an opinion there. What's next? Uh, you know, will there be laws saying that you can't oppose it? Uh, will, you, uh, will you be obliged to, uh, if you're a baker, for instance, to bake a, a, a cake, a wedding cake, even though as a Christian you might be against it? What's next? Well, I think a lot of what's happening at the moment is people expressing their frustration in other ways because the issue hasn't been resolved. The, frankly, the discussion around marriage for same-sex couples has descended into a sort of national silliness where people are just taking more and more extreme and absurd positions because they're not actually debating the issue. And they're not actually debating resolution of the issue because the parliament won't deal with it. Uh, and so I think we've got to be mindful that uh, uh, that is part of the reason why we're seeing this type of ridiculous behaviour. But no, I don't think that's the future at all. It's only the future if we keep not dealing with it and finding a sensible way through it where we try and bring people together to unite the country. Uh, and I proposed ways you can do that in the past around designing laws to make sure that people can never face persecution uh, as a consequence of their opinion on marriage because at the heart it sits in people's uh, faith traditions or, or their views of tradition as a general proposition and how important it is. So you're, you're suggesting to help this go through, do we need also to have laws saying you may speak freely against it, you may uh, refuse to participate in ceremonies as a service provider or whatever and you will not get sued because we're already seeing like a Tasmanian Archbishop getting dragged off uh, to uh, the Tasmanian Anti-Discrimination Tribunal. We need laws to stop that happening again, don't we? Well, the case you've cited with Archbishop Porteous was an overreach for law when we took the principle in 18C that it was unlawful to offend somebody uh, and took it to a state law and said it isn't just about race, it's about everybody. And he got captured with that. So that was a bad law to start with. That really has nothing to do with the debate around marriage except for the fact that he was using or engaging that argument. The same thing could have come up on matters of gender, um, of uh, disability uh, or of people's pregnancy. Uh, as an example. So uh, that's an entirely separate debate. But do we need to make sure that nobody faces persecution as a pathway to resolving this debate? I think resolutely yes. But I, I do think conservatives who oppose a change in the law need to be mindful that if there isn't a change of the law uh, under a government that's sympathetic to those uh, issues, you'll get a decision by Labor and the Greens uh, who will be completely dismissive and disinterested. Um, uh, lastly, uh, uh, Tim, the push for recognition of Aborigines in the Constitution and giving Australians with Aboriginal ancestors extra legal rights as a consequence. Last week, a meeting of Aboriginal leaders said they wanted a treaty and they wanted a separate kind of parliament for just Aborigines to advise the real parliament and they wanted that in the, constitutions, in the Constitution. Are you in favour of racial division like that? Well, I'm not in, facial, in, in favour of racial division at all. I'm in favour of any pathway that seeks to unite the country. The reality is, um, firstly, a treaty I don't think is going to happen. But secondly, we're not a 
country at conflict. There's disparity between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and the rest of the country, and we need to address that, uh, that uh, historical injustice that's led to that, and we can do that. But that isn't solved by a treaty. The problems aren't sitting in Canberra, they're sitting in community. And so establishing the other proposal of this national body in the Constitution that tries to deal with problems in Canberra, I don't think is a solution uh, to that problem either. We've got to focus on how we build communities from the bottom up and make sure that we're taking care of children and families uh, across the country from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander backgrounds if we want to fix the problems facing Indigenous Australia today. But why are more Liberals not speaking out? This is actually a matter of grave importance and moral principle too. We should be one people under one law and we should not be bantuizing, uh, you know, having a Bantu type system here where you've got one group of people on the basis of race having two votes, one for their uh, assembly and one for the national, par uh, national parliament. We can't have this kind of racism, this kind of tribalism enshrined in our constitution. Why don't more Liberals say that? Well, I know what whatever was going to come out of the Uluru meeting was always going to be the Indigenous perspective and part of it, it they made it clear in the statement it's a it's the Uluru statement from the heart what we've got to offer is our heads and our heads uh, should guide the report that's going to go the referendum from the referendum council to the government uh, in the, over the next month and actually try and make sure that they don't take positions firstly uh, that would seek to divide us by race but actually focus on how we're going to unify the country and also what's achievable so I think that can be done and part of it's about having a respectful dialogue and saying exactly the things I've said and setting out some demarcators very clearly that I don't think a treaty is going to happen. I don't think we should want a treaty either. And the other part of it is I don't think a national body uh, is the solution to the problem. The problems sit within Aboriginal communities, not in Canberra. No, good, well said. Uh, Tim Wilson, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Andrew.